So um, the central question today of my talk is, if we want to classify languages using computational phylogenetic methods, what sorts of linguistic traits ought we use to infer language history? Um, and I'm going to stick with what has been basically so far the standard answer. Um, so Dunn and colleagues have been using typological traits, but most people have been using lexical items. Um, this goes back not even uh, to 2003 with Gray and Atkinson, but further back into the 1950s with Morris Swadesh's now dis discredited method of lexicostatistics. Um, so most work has used phylogenetic methods, uh, sorry, most phylogenetic methods have used lexical characters. Um, so summary here, Gray and Atkinson 2003, using Indo-European, lots of other examples. I'm sure you, some of you are familiar with the literature. Um, so what are lexical characters, and the little table here has intruded on the last line, but that's okay. Um, so when we look at lexical characters, we're looking at cognates. Um, so what are cognates? Cognates are words that share a common genetic origin. That means they're not borrowed, and they're not similar just by chance. Um, so words can be very similar by chance. A really lovely example is English mess and Kakchikel Mayan mess both meaning exactly the same thing and pronounced in exactly the same way, but they're just not related. Um, so it's important to note that cognates need not actually have the same phonetic shape. They don't need to sound the same, and they don't need to have the same meaning at all. So for English, we can have English town, um, German down, and Dutch tuin. Um, all of the same origin originally, which was essentially an enclosure, but now they mean town, fence, and garden, and you can get horrible, better examples if you go to other Indo-European languages. For instance, Irish, uh, tune, or dune means fort. Um, so cognates need not mean the same thing or sound the same. Um, so once cognacy is established, uh, we encode these into binary characters representing either presence of a form or absence of a form. Um, and the implication is that languages that have presence of both of these. Uh, so for instance, German and Dutch both have presence of this hound-like form for dog. They're more closely related. Um, it's buried, of course, in the methods, but they should have at some point some innovation, or we should be able to figure out some innovation from somewhere or the other. Of course, English here is innovative, switching its hound-like word to dog and its dog-like word to hound. Um, these words are generally selected from a list of so-called basic vocabulary, as we've went over. Um, so this is developed by Morris Swadesh. Um, in linguistics, this has been basically fairly heavily criticized, the idea at least that these words are basic. As, as we saw with the Uralic presentation, you have to refine them sometimes. Sometimes the words simply don't exist. So there's a large number of languages in the world, for instance, that don't have a word for snow, which happened to be in Swadesh's original formulation of the Swadesh list, so that's not at all useful. Um, and the idea that these words aren't borrowed has also been pretty thoroughly discredited. Um, the rates of borrowing, however, are lower in these sorts of words, so they provide a fairly useful data set in trying to get a stronger phylogenetic signal. Um, so not all work has looked exclusively at phylogenetic or lexical characters. So Warner et al. 1995 and several subsequent papers have looked at Indo-European languages using lexical characters, phonological characters, morph and morphological characters. I'll talk a little more about these in a bit. Um, Pillard 2009 looked at Japonic using both lexical and phonological characters. Um, and essentially all non-computational work in historical linguistics, looking at classifying languages into groups has been entirely holistic and not relied simply on lexical items. Um, okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to argue that lexical characters alone do not accurately classify languages um, and do so by comparing Lian Hasegawa 2011's reconstruction of Japonic with our prior knowledge of what Japonic ought to be from just more general historical linguistics and that we ought to really be using a wider range of characters, so phonological characters, morphological characters, and syntactic characters in future analyses of language history. Um, so a very brief tree overview, I'll get into some of these a little bit later. So the Japonic languages are essentially, by most count, five modern languages, so Hachijo, Japanese, Amami, Okinawan, Miyako, Yayama, and Yonaguni. I've included a few extinct languages here, all marked with daggers, that I will talk about a little bit at some point. Um, 
so what would we expect from a japonic phylogeny that was well recovered using these methods we have through computational phylogenetics? We'd first expect a primary split between Japanese varieties and Ryukyuan varieties. Um, I cite Hokama 1971 here. The, the actual citation should probably be something in the 1890s um, by Iha Fuyu. Uh, a primary split between northern and southern varieties of Ryukyuan. Um, the position of the Yonaguni language in the southern Ryukyu should be fairly unclear. Um, there's lots of argument about where it actually belongs. Is it a primary branch of the Ryukyuan subgroup? Is it part of the southern Ryukyuan subgroup, or is it part of a Yayama subgroup? Um, and then there should be some diffusion, though not much, throughout Ryukyuan. Um, moving on to the other half of the family. So we should expect an early divergence of the Hachijo language from the rest of the Japonic varieties. It retains a lot of very archaic features. I'll talk about a few of them. Um, that we would not expect to find in other Japanese varieties. Um, there should be a secondary east-west division. So Hachijo belongs to a very old east-west division in Japan. So I don't have a map, but think about Japan and then rotate it about 90 degrees this way. Um, the traditional classifications of Japan don't talk about north and south in terms of linguistic features. They talk about east and west. If you prefer north and south, just rotate the map back in your head. Um, there, yeah, so that di dialect division should be weak and recent. Um, and there should be significant diffusion throughout Japanese varieties, um, possibly including Hachijo, although it's not clear. Um, and then the root of the chronology should be around 2850 BP to 2250 BP, depending on whether you buy the short or long chronology in archaeology. Um, the short chronology has basically been developed off of morphology in terms of pottery and metallurgy and agriculture in comparison with work on the Asian mainland. Um, the older long chronology has been basically established with more modern radioisotope dating, um, which Japanese archaeologists for some reason do not seem to care for. Okay, so this is fairly small, I know. Um, so this is the tree in Lee and Hasegawa, 2011. Do I have a laser pointer? I do. So. We find a couple of things. So the first, well, let's start with the congruities, and I'll, I think I have slides on these two. So we do recover this split between the Ryukyuan varieties down here in pink and purple, and the Japonic varieties up top in red, orange, yellow, and blue, which is excellent. It's what we expect to find. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll omit this. You guys can look at the tree. I can look at that. So. We also find a split between North Ryukyuan, which is the dark purple, and South Ryukyuan, which is the light pink. And way down here, we find a fairly uncertain position of Yonaguni um, in the south. Again, all these are things we'd expect based on what we know. Um, however, there are several things we find that we don't really expect based on the stuff we know from historical linguistics. Um, so in this data, Hachijo diverged very late. Um, so the split is up here around oh, 200 BP. Um, however, it's at a very low confidence, right? It's below 50%. Um, and we don't find any real tra trace of a secondary east-west division in Japanese dialects. They're kind of all over the place. Um, we find significant conflicting signal. Um, so I extrapolated the delta score and the Q residual, which are just measures of tree likeness from uh, the LNH data. Um, so the Ryukyuan varieties appear to be, at least based off of delta scores, fairly tree-like. Um, and the Japanese varieties v appear to be fairly untree-like, or less tree-like, at least. Um, interestingly, the Q residual scores and the delta scores do not line up with one another. I don't know what to make of that. And as far as I know, no one actually really does. There's no good statistical measures, as far as I'm aware, to compare delta scores between different varieties or Q residual scores between different varieties. So what exactly we want to make of that is unclear. Um, but we can look at uh, non-tree likeness in other ways. So we can look at, say, a neighbor net analysis where we find the Ryukyuan languages on the right in figure B are fairly tree-like with a little bit of reticulation, whereas in figure A, the Japanese varieties are a uh, lovely little mess. So, 
I want to move on to why we're not exactly finding what we would always expect from the historical linguistics kind of traditional view of Japonic languages. Um, so I'm going to summarize. There is quite a bit of problematic data. To just give one example, the word for what. And so this is a cognate set again. So they looked at the, the pronoun what in all the different languages. So in Japanese, we find dono. In Naze, which is one of the two North Ryukyuan varieties, we find duin. In Ryukyuan, we find nu or no in Old Japanese nani. Um, and miyako and ji. So these are the four separate characters. I just gave single examples of each. Um, the data is, simply put, incorrect. The Japanese word dono does not mean what, it means which. Um, and this is about 40, 40, yeah, 49 exactly varieties have this incorrect coding. Um, so the actual word for Japanese, what is nani? Um, naze din, again, means which. Um, it's cognate with Japanese dono, but even in this incorrect data is not coded as being cognate. Um, so the correct naze word is something like nu, like in Okinawan. Um, so Ryukyuan, nu is what? Um, this doesn't actually affect the analysis, but it's also often given as morphologically complex. So it's given as form something like nu, nu in Okinawan, which means of what? It's not really what. One of the varieties has a nu yabin, which means something like what is it? Um, and then Miyako and Ji means which, it's not cognate to Dono, so that's actually coded correctly, but again, the form isn't what we would actually expect in the actual data. Um, so the number of characters is incorrect. It should not be four, it should be one. There is one cognate set across all of Japonic, all of the words are related. Um, so you can see the chart here, so Nanui in Proto-Japonic, and we lose all sorts of features that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so this moves into my argument that this sort of data is lossy, that lexical characters are lossy sorts of data, and that we probably don't want to be using them, or at least relying on them entirely. Um, right, so if we just went off of cognacy, we'd have one character, and all the states would be, of course, one using a binary analysis. Um, here I've abridged some of the phonological innovations, which would give us a much stronger phylogenetic signal and a larger number of characters. Okay. Um, so, for instance, the Japanese simplification of ui to i, right, um, that does not occur in the Ryukyuan varieties. They have a separate simplification of the final uh, vowels. Um, so we're losing out on quite a bit of information. So I, I think it ended up when I totaled it up for all, at least the sound changes being something like six characters versus four incorrect characters or one correct character only using lexical items. Um, so there are further issues such as the uh, lack of inclusion of, of certain varieties that we have pretty good knowledge of that just have not been included. So Leon Hasegawa's report that their source for old Japanese records that there are acknowledges there could have been some linguistic variation in the Nara period, which is the period of old Japanese, so around the 800s. Um, and at present, we don't know the fates of their languages, if there were any. Um, we actually, for some of them, have quite good data. So. Eastern Old Japanese is very well attested. Kupchik 2011 is an extensive grammar and dictionary. We could easily, from that, extract a whole list of, well, not complete, but at least in terms of lexical items, a fairly complete list of lexical items that we could use for a phylogenetic reconstruction, and they're simply uh, not known. Um, so not all phonological characters, I seem to have made them into something much bigger than they could be sometimes, are, are particularly useful for us. So um, there are many cases of convergent innovation in language where we have just sound changes that are fairly common. So P to F to H is very common across languages. Um, and we find this in several separate branches having kind of parallel changes that don't really tell us anything informative in Japonic. Um, so we do, however, find very informative characters, such as the change of Y to D in Yonaguni by itself. So for instance, Tokyo Japanese Yama, Yonaguni Dama, meaning, uh, both meaning mountain. 
Um, so we could also use morphosyntactic characters. So by morphosyntactic characters, I mean changes that don't involve single words or don't involve single sounds. So they could be things like grammatical endings or prefixes or suffixes or some sort of thing on a word. So in um, Okinawan, you find kachuru sumuchi and sumuchi kachun for the book that I write versus I write the book. In Japanese, the verb does not alter form whether it's being in a relative clause or not. This is a innovation in Japanese, in standard Japanese, which has lost the form. Um, so this is a character we could easily, or as Eric suggests, perhaps not quite as easily include. Um, similarly, loss of case marking. I think I'm running a little short on time, so I've got enough. Okay. So loss of accusative case marking in Okinawan. So we have this marker that says this thing is an object in a sentence. In modern Okinawan, you don't have it anymore, but in old Okinawan and in previous varieties of Japonic and in most other varieties of Japonic, you actually have this form. Um, so that's not to say, again, lexical characters aren't actually useful. So in uh, the word for man, for instance, we find three characters um, if we just want to code it that way. So the Japanese form, which is wotoko, wotoko um, which came from a form meaning young child, hachijo wonokoko, uh, which means male of uh, male child, or little male child, something like that, however you want to translate that, and ryukyu makiga. Um, so we find useful lexical characters as well that give us a strong phylogenetic signal. Um, uh, here's another example. We don't need to go over that too much, I think. Um, so conclusions. Uh, good phylogenies can only come from good data. I don't think that really needs to be repeated, but apparently so. Um, and if we are interested in accurate phylogenies or networks, uh, we need informative data and we need accurate data. So even if we're interested in, in say, borrowing phenomenon across languages, we can't actually go forward with a realistic analysis unless our data is correct. Um, so even if we use character-based methods versus uh, distance-based methods, it's still possible to lose information. It's, it's fairly well known that using a, a distance-based analysis like, say, uh, uh, UPGMA or something, you lose information by converting characters into distance. Um, here, we're converting one sort of character into another, and we're still losing information. Um, and then, so the conclusion from all of this, in sum, is that further work of this type should use a wider variety of characters, and of course, the data should be more accurate, if possible. Thank you. Thank you.